I'm doing a, a talk now called From the Higgs Boson to Molecular Radiology, which is a story of spectral photon counting. And uh, it starts way back in the 1970s. This picture here uh, of my father's hand um, and his watch, taken by one of the Mars team members, Brian, in fact, I think one of our more popular photos because it's a nice example of being able to see inside the body um, using imaging. My talk is going to um, start off with our goal and our motivation, where are we going? Um, then I'll talk about CERN's role in, uh, going back to the 1970s and 80s, new detectors and colour x-rays. Um, I'll talk about our scanners and uh, where they're going and what we've, uh, what we've done in the past. Uh, look at some of the medical applications and then have a kind of future outlook of where things might be in the next uh, decade or two. So what do I mean by spectral CT? When, of course, the Mars program started, the term spectral CT was still in, a little bit in debate. People called it spectroscopic CT, multi-energy CT. The field seems to settle down to this term now. A traditional CT works with an X-ray source putting out different wavelengths, frequencies, or colors. Um, they're attenuated by the object or the patient, and you then have an energy integrating detector to give you one point on the attenuation curve, linear attenuation curve. With our scanner um, and other photon counting systems, you take the same broad spectrum of energies coming in from the X-ray tube. Again, they're attenuated by the patient. And then you have a photon counting detector that can separate those out into different energy bands, um, giving you multiple points on the linear attenuation curve. And that allows you to start identifying the materials in the object. CT, of course, was um, a key part of this. So CT is to simply take multiple projections um, and turn into a 3D object. The first CT in New Zealand was built in 1971 um, out at the University of Canterbury. Um, it was one of the first CTs built in the world about a year, six months after Hounsfield announced his results. Of course, it's very reasonably simple. So here's a standard uh, one from our local hospital. This person has iodine contrast in their vascular system, in the aorta, and they've got a big lump, uh, soft tissue mass, um, surrounding some of the blood vessels. And we can see everything's different shades of grey, despite the fact we know there's iodine, fat, water, and calcium in that image. We just get grayscale. Now, there's 300 million CTs taken around the world at the moment, um, and the global device market's about 47 billion. And it's used in almost every part of uh, health, uh, joints, uh, imaging, bone, implants, cancer diagnosis and management, cardiovascular disease, so that's strokes and heart attacks, um, and infectious diseases. So if you're properly sick, so to speak, and in hospital, the chances of you having a CT scan are extremely high. I've seen predictions from places like the NHS that put out a report um, about two months ago saying they would like to double the number of imaging services available to the UK uh, patients by 2025. So it's going to keep growing. Um, there's a huge motivation to keep doing more imaging, push it out to the community, uh, because it speeds up the diagnosis and treatment of patients. So where did this begin? So CERN has been looking at new detectors for, uh, well, their, their motivation was to discover the Higgs boson and, and detect that. Um, there's two big experiments there. Uh, new Zealand's been involved with a compact muon solenoid, uh, compact in that it's only 12,500 tonnes. It's very dense. And it sits on the accelerator there, which is 27 kilometres uh, circumference. Within that, they have what they call the pixel barrel, the tracker, or the silicon um, barrel. And that's semiconductor detectors uh, the, the charged particles interact with or, and produce a pulse that's then measured. Uh, the CMS tracker here is several square, kilometer, uh, several square meters of silicon. So where did they get these detectors from? Way back in the late 70s, uh, three people at CERN, uh, one of which uh, we, uh, we know reasonably well, Eric Heiner, um, came up with this concept of instead of using bubble chambers and analog calorimeters, maybe you could use semiconductors from microchips as a way to start detecting um, the, these charged particles. And so um, he, he told me last year that I think he got a, a budget of about 100,000 Swiss francs to investigate whether this was possible. Uh, meanwhile, the main detector budgets were in the millions, um, and him and some others went ahead and proved that you could actually measure these particles with solid state detectors. Um, they won the award for high energy physics in 2017 for this development. By the mid-90s, 
there was quite a few people at CERN and associated um, institutions saying, well, if you can do it for these high energy particles, surely you can do it for other particles such as X-rays. So a number of institutes have got together. Uh, the Medipix 4 collaboration, I think, has about 16 institutes. The Medipix 3 is at about 25 institutes. Um, looking at how you can take these uh, particle dete the detectors and turn them into other applications. Um, it was called Medipix right back in the mid-90s because Michael Campbell, who is the, the spokesman for, for the organisation, felt these should be useful in medicine in some ways. If you can measure x-rays, they must be useful. We use Medipix 3 within our um, scanners. Um, measures up to eight x-ray colours at once with 110 micron pixels and 16,000 pixels per 14 millimetre chip with about 4,500 transistors per pixel. So each pixel is a small computer and you've got 16,000 in one bit of silicon and of course our scanners have at the moment about 12 of these detectors. So what about our team and what have we been doing? Uh, we work across multiple universities in New Zealand. Uh, we have agreements with Canterbury, Otago, Lincoln and Auckland. Um, and we have a whole bunch of international partners um, scattered around uh, the US, Europe and Asia. Um, and we've won a bunch of awards for our, our products. Um, you know, the Canterbury Chamber of Commerce Award for uh, Best Manufacturer. We've, we've won innovation awards, etc. This was the first human translatable scanner that um, we, the Mars group produced. Um, it went to the Notre Dame Imaging Lab, and I'm told it looks a little bit like a barbecue. You put your sample in it, um, and you can scan it. So a lot of work has been done around the world on these scanners, um, looking at various applications. Our scanner is a human-ready system, and that it works up to 120 keV. Um, so you, whatever results you get on there, you can translate to humans. Um, it's uh, got its own image processing system, its own visualization system, its own calibration systems. This is our experimental scanner. Um, it's an open bore system that you can bolt uh, the X-ray tube and various detectors on and off, and it allows us to do quite a wide range of experiments. So on this, we've looked at uh, things from like heads, necks, hips, uh, feet, hands, of a full range of experimental devices. And this is our, our latest scanner, the Extremity 5X120. Um, this is a scanner that's designed for running in a clinic, such as an orthopedic clinic, an acute care clinic. So that's taking the technology and putting it in a format where it's directly applicable to human health and can be used by clinicians to look at patients. So, the Mars collaboration, this is the workshop we actually had two years ago when the New Zealand borders were open. We had about 90 to 100 people, 20, um, 20 international guests. Uh, and it's an interesting group of people because um, we have um, engineers, physicists, computer scientists, biochemists, pathologists, surgeons, orthopods, etc. We started out looking at really simple things such as identifying different contrast agents. So in this mouse, um, we've got gold, gadolinium, iodine, fat, calcium and water, and of course you can scan the whole mouse and quantify them. So this data set I think is available for download, um, but you can identify those materials and quantify them. We've done some work on atheroma imaging. This is a blood vessel that goes up your neck to the brain. Um, and here we've got a traditional CT from the local hospital. You can see the iodine in the blood vessel um, is showing up white, and then there's a, a lump narrowing the blood vessel. We've looked at those specimens, so they have a, those people often have an operation, and from that we can image the specimen and start to see things like the necrotic core. We're also able to see things that are very hard to see on other systems. So in this particular example, we've been able to identify that there's a hemorrhage or iron has leaked out into the blood vessel wall. And that's um, telling us that this is a particularly unstable plaque. We've looked at bone health. We've done this, this particular study with Oregon Health uh, Sciences University, but we've worked with other places on, on bone health, such as um, Chinese University of Hong Kong. 
Um, and we can measure both the structure and the composition in the same image. So we can see the bone microstructure, the trabeculae, uh, and the cortex, and we can also get a, a 3D map of the calcium, lipid, and water at about 100 micron. So that's a high-resolution functional imaging of the bone. We've been able to reduce metal artifacts. So in this case, is a sheep's clavicle with a plate and screw attached. And as you can see, we, we can identify the metal and see very few artifacts from it. We've been able to look at various um, crystals that form in the body, such as uh, in gout and pseudogout. Um, in this particular example, we've looked at a finger which was amputated because a patient had a lot of pain. Imaged on a dual NGCT and then on a, multi, on a Mars system, and we have much, much higher spatial resolution and much better identification of the various crystal types. We've looked at osteoarthritis um, with a number of studies. Um, in this particular case, we've used glycamine, done glycaminoglycan imaging um, by infusing gadolinium, um, and that will diffuse into the, the surface. It's very similar to an MRI technique known as degemeric. We've done some molecular imaging of bone. Um, in this instance, our partners in Maryland have produced nanoparticles that they inject into an animal, and it targets areas of high bone turnover. So on the left, it's a human finger where the, they've uh, damaged the cortex and um, incubated it, um, and it's identified where the bone has been damaged. The, the image on the right is a mouse where they've surgically opened up the animal, uh, damaged the bone, closed the, the, um, the animal up and injected a contrast agent, and the, that contrast agent targets the area of bone damage, and we can quantify that damage. We've also looked at molecular imaging for cancer. So in the left example, we've tagged the HER2 positive cell lines in a, in a cell pellet um, and compared that with untagged cells from, uh, or, or different nanoparticles that target um, uh, Raji cells. On the right, um, our partners at Notre Dame have produced nanoparticles or molecular targeting agents um, for microcalcification. So again, looking at breast cancer, saying, look, we can see some of these uh, targets that are only available, uh, that, that are difficult to see um, without a contrast agent. One of the cool things about this is that um, we've identified two different molecular targets within breast cancer, as I say, the HER2 positive cell lines, and a second target, the microcalcifications. So that means we could actually uh, start doing experiments where we look for two different cell lines or two different pathological processes on the same uh, molecular image. We've moved on to human imaging. Um, so this is the, the first human images we took. Um, and you get the bone microstructure in this particular case at about 80 micron, and you get the calcium map and the water map. Um, so it's a little bit like MR and a little bit like high-res CT in the same go, um, but done with low dose, low X-ray dose, um, and very high resolution. So in this particular example, again, we can see on the left some library images of CT and MR, and you can see on the right the, the, the images of the foot, where we've got the calcium, the fat, and the water as separate channels. So it's multi-channel X-ray imaging. So where are we going? Um, we just started to, or we've been thinking for a long time about Medipix 4. That's going to have 8 to 12 energies, depending on quite how you set it up. And it's going to be four side buttable, so you can produce large areas, so we can look at much larger objects. And it's going to be about um, 5 to 10 times faster, so that will improve our imaging speed. There's also the TimePix family of uh, detectors um, that, uh, cousins, I guess, or, or siblings of Medipix 4. And that has an event driven readout. So the image I've got here from uh, Rafa, one of the, the CERN engineers, he's taken an image of a circuit board, um, and he's been able to measure um, using the time picks events, um, at, I, th I think about 24 different energy bins between 5 and 100 keV, um, and he's been able to um, achieve sub-pixel resolution. So instead of looking at 55 micron pixels, he's been able to get down to sort of the 10 to 20 micron um, at spatial resolution. Our scanners, um, we've got this experimental system that we're still running, and that's pointed to, out to us that there's going to be benefits in head and neck imaging, particularly dental imaging, weight-bearing uh, uh, knee and ankle imaging, 
hip scanners and breast CTs and eventually full body CTs. So there's a potential to go from our first clinical risk scanner that I, I showed a few slides ago, all the way through a steps, uh, steps with different scanners addressing different market segments and uh, different clinical problems. Um, and there's a really nice pathway that the FDA have for a product series called um, predicate devices. So um, be able, we're going to be able to introduce these to different parts of medicine um, over the next few years. So in summary, um, there's a direct line from fundamental high energy physics research done in the 70s and 80s to improving health. Um, there's likely benefit to a vast array of medical conditions. As I say, 300 million people get a CT each year, and you probably only need to improve each of those CTs a little bit to have had a massive health impact. And as I said, if you believe the NHS and, and other health providers, there's a likely increase in imaging of a factor of two over the next five to ten years, and so a very large number of people stand to benefit from these technologies. So thank you for attending, um, and I'm happy to take some questions.